All right, guys, Mr. Antonucci here. And in this video, I want to talk about what you need to know as you prepare for the AP Stats exam. As you can see on the screen, so you're about to take the AP Stats exam. Um, so now we want to talk a little bit about some of the actual concepts. So collecting data, there are two broad areas of data, experiments and sampling that we talk about in AP. You have to know some general concepts and techniques about each one. So know, know the distinction between experiments and samples. They're not the same exact type of thing. OK, um, so for samples, the idea there is to estimate a population parameter by measuring measuring a representative subset of the population. And we do that by introducing um, randomness uh, in, into how we collect that sample. Now, the purpose of an experiment is to demonstrate a cause and effect relationship by controlling extraneous factors. Remember the, the placebo effect. Now, experiments are very rarely performed on random samples because it's like there's an ethical issue there. You can't randomly just test people with a new drug without their permission kind of thing. And some of the practicality makes it nearly impossible to do that. So this is why it, it's you have to be cautious with ex, with um, with generalizing the results of an experiment, because if you maybe you did an experiment on women um, but you can't generalize that result to men or one particular um, race or ethnicity can't necessarily uh, generalize the results of that cause and effect relationship to other groups of people. Now, blocking versus stratifying. Um, lots of times there's confusion. What's the difference between those? And the, the kind of summary, simple answer is that blocking is done in experiments and stratifying is done with samples. There are some similarities between the two. Basically, you're dividing up the subjects before random assignment or selection, um, but they are not interchangeable. So in blocking, you divide your subjects in advance based on some factor you know uh, or believe is relevant to the study and then randomly assign treatments within each block. And things you want to rem remember is that you don't just block just to do it. You block based on some factor you think will impact the response of the treatment. The blocking itself, number two, is not random. The randomization occurs within each block, essentially creating kind of two or more miniature experiments. And blocks should be um, homogeneous. In other words, they should be alike with respect to the blocking fa factor. So for example, if I want to find out if playing classical music during tests will result in higher mean scores, I could randomly assign half my students to the room with music and the other half to the normal room. But if I know that juniors consistently score higher than seniors, I may want to account for that source of variation in the results. So I can block by grade by separating juniors and seniors first and then randomly assigning half the juniors to the music room and the other half to the normal room. And then I do the same thing with the seniors. Uh, so for this design to be valid, I have to expect that each grade will respond to the music similarly. In other words, I'm, I know that juniors will score higher, but I expect to see a similar improvement or decline in both groups as a result of having the music. At the end of my study, then I can subtract out the effect of grade level to reduce the for the um, uncounted, unaccounted for variation in the results. Now, stratified sampling versus cluster sampling. Again, many students confuse stratified and cluster sampling since both of them involve groups of subjects. There are two key differences between them. First, in stratified sampling, you divide up the population based on some factor you think or believe is important. But in cluster sampling, groups are naturally occurring. For example, like a school of fish naturally occurs. Second, in stratified sampling, we randomly select subjects from each stratum but in cluster sampling, we randomly select <clears throat> one or more clusters and measure every subject in each cluster. Now, there's, of course, more advanced techniques in which samples are taken within clusters, but we don't really get into those advanced techniques. Now, some final thoughts. It, it is especially important to stay focused when answering questions about design. Too many students got to get caught up in minor details but miss the big ideas of randomization and control. Remember that your mission in responding to questions is to demonstrate your understanding of the major concepts of the course. Now let's talk a little bit about describing data. 
one thing that's important to know is that the interquartile range is a number. So I, I, we, we've seen responses like the IQR goes from 15 to 32. Well, we know kind of know what you mean, but that's not really what the IQR is. That's like saying that the number 17 goes from 15 to 32. It just doesn't really make sense to make that statement. The interquartile range is defined as the third quartile minus the first quartile, which gives you a single value. So also be able to construct graph, graphs by hand. You may be asked to draw a box plot, um, including outliers, stem plots, histograms, or other graphs by hand. The test writers have become very clever and present problems in such a way that you cannot simply depend on your calculator to just graph it before you. And we've talked about this previously, but labeling is very, very, very important. Any graph you're asked to draw should have clearly labeled axes with appropriate scales indicated. And if you're asked to draw side by side box plots, make sure you label which one is which. You want to communicate clearly there. Now, refer to referring to graphs explicitly. When you answer questions based on a graph or graphs, you need to be specific. Don't just say the female times are clearly higher than the male times. Instead, the median female time is higher than the first quartile of the male times. I'm just coming up with an example here. Uh, you can back up your statements by marking on the graph. The graders look at everything you write, and often marks on the graph make the difference between uh, two scores. Also, look at all aspects of the data. When given a set of data or, or summaries of data, make sure you consider the center, spread, shape, outliers or unusual features. Often a question will focus on one or two of these areas and be sure to focus your answer to match that. Is it skewed in any which way? A distribution, remember this, is scaled, excuse me, skewed in the direction that the tail goes, not where the, not where the peak is. So um, it sounds backwards. So just be careful. That's one of the common misconceptions that students have uh, coming out of a first year stats course. Also, make sure you slow down. Uh, the describing data questions may appear easy. So many students, you know, just rush right into them and start answering without making sure they know what the problem is about. Make sure you understand what variables are being measured uh, and read the labels on the graphs carefully. You may be given a type of graph that you've never seen before, but if you slow down and make sure you process and digest what it's talking about, you should be okay there. Now for inference, not every problem involves interest. Uh, inference, excuse me, um, you, you've probably spent, typically inference is done in the second half of the year, you've probably spent a, almost a good semester on inference procedures. And that sometimes causes students to forget about the rest of statistics um, and make every problem into an inference problem. So be careful to not turn a straightforward probability or normal distribution question into a full-blown hypothesis test. Now, hypothesis, hypothesis is Blah, blah, blah. I can't talk. Uh, hypotheses are about populations. So the point of a hypothesis test is to reach a conclusion about a population based on a sample from it. You don't need to make hypothesis about the sample. When writing hypothesis, conclusions, and formulas, be careful with your wording and symbols so that you do not get the population and the sample mixed up. For example, don't write that the null hypothesis is x equals 12 or mu equals mean heart rate of study participants. You want to phrase it in context of a population parameter. So make sure you check your assumptions or conditions. Um, it's the not, not the same thing as stating them. And I, I've talked about this briefly earlier in, in the video. Checking means actually showing that the assumptions are met by the information given in the problem. For example, don't just write n times p is greater than 10. Write n times p equals what the data is, in this case, 150 times 0 0.32, which is 48, which is greater than 10. Everyone, everybody knows you can do the math in your head or on your calculator, but writing it down makes it clear to the reader that you're tying the assumption to the problem rather than just writing a list of things that you memorized. Now, confidence intervals also have assumptions. They have the same assumptions as their matching tests, and you need to check them just as carefully. Also, make sure you link your conclusions to your numbers. Don't just say, I reject the null and conclude that the mean heart rate for males is greater than 72. That sentence doesn't tell us why you reject it. Instead, use the p-value and your alpha level. Since the p-value of 0.0034 is less than 0.05, I reject the null and 
the rest of your conclusion. Make sure you're consistent. Make sure your hypothesis and conclusions match. If you find an error in your computations, change your conclusions if necessary. Even if your numbers are wrong, you will normally get some form of credit for a conclusion that is correct based on your numbers, even if your numbers are wrong. If you get totally stuck and can't come up with a test statistic or p-value, make one up as you make one up and then state your conclusion as you would based on those because you don't just get the points for the correct number they're looking for the, a comprehensive understanding of the whole process and procedure so interpreting a confidence interval is different than interpreting the confidence level remember those two things are different interpreting the confidence interval usually goes i'm 95 percent confident that the proportion of ap statistics students are highly intelligent is between 88 and 93 percent or the superintendent should give seniors seniors Friday off since we are 99% confident that between 72 and 81% of the parents support this plan. Interpreting a confidence level usually goes something more along the lines like this. If this procedure were repeated many times, approximately 95% of the intervals produced would contain the true proportion of parents who support the plan. So make sure you understand the distinction and difference between interpreting a confidence interval versus a confidence level. Now a little bit about regression, graph first, then calculate. So the most important part of the regression process is looking at the plots. Regression questions will frequently provide a scatter plot of the original data along with uh, a plot of the residuals from a linear regression. Look at these plots before answering any part of the question and make sure you understand the scales used. Is it linear? Remember that an R value is only useful for data we have already decided is linear. Therefore, an R value does not help you decide if, if the data is linear. So to determine if data is linear, look at a scatter plot of the original data and the residuals from a linear regression. If a line is an appropriate model, the residuals, residuals should appear to be randomly scattered. Now, as we wrap this up, um, just a little bit about computer output. It's very likely that you'll be given computer output for a linear regression. If you can read the output correctly, these questions are normally uh, a little bit easier. You should be able to write the regression equation using the coefficients in the output and also be able to find the values of R and R squared. Most software packages provide the value of R squared. If you're asked for the value of R, you will need to take the square root and look at the slope to determine if R should be positive or negative. Now, interpreting R, if you're asked to interpret an R value, be sure to include strength, direction, type, and context. A good interpretation will sound something like, there is a weak strength, positive direction, linear type relationship between the number of math classes a person has taken in yearly income context. Okay, well, that's it. We just covered a ton of stuff as you're about to take the AP stats exam. I hope that was helpful to you. Let me know in the comments below if it was. If you have any other tips or you know pieces of encouragement or things to look out for, put them in the comments so other people can uh, benefit from what you know. Also, make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that bell for notifications when new videos are uploaded. All right, guys, take care.